Welcome back to another live stream. My name is Scott Wilkinson. I'm a professional body piercer. And today what I'm doing is I'm going through all your piercing questions as best I can, try to get to everyone's, and we're gonna answer those to the best of my ability. And behind the, the camera, I should say, is Jared. Hey everybody, how you doing today? So yeah, that's what we're doing today. So how was your week, Jared? It's been pretty good. Pretty good. good. Trying to stay busy. Good, good, good. Same here. Same here. I'm yeah, running a shop, piercing people on the live stream. It's a lot of work. A lot I of work. But you know what? I'm having the time of my life. I love doing what I do. Love Absolutely. Doing what I do. So do we have any questions here? We do. Let's get here. started with one that everyone's always asking. Why can't I just get pierced with a ring? Or can I just get pierced with a ring? Or is there a reason it has to be a stud first? Talk about it. Sure, sure. I know everyone likes the look of the ring, but the problem is with a ring is the amount of movement that can happen. Now, with a ring, the ring's going to spin and rotate. And if you have crusties on your piercing, and we all get those in the new piercing, it's going to act like a file. It's going to scratch and irritate. It's going to move. Plus, your body's healing that curve in there. And when that ring's turning side to side, back and forth, you're changing the angle of your piercing. So you're asking for nothing but a lot of movement, a lot of irritation, a longer healing process and a piercing that might migrate to a different position than you actually don't want it. So start out with the stud in like 99% of the piercings and once it's healed, then change to the ring. Now, just for argument, are there piercings that you do start with a ring for some reason? Sure. I just said 99% of the piercings. What's that other one? The doff piercing is one I'll always start with a ring. I never use a curved barbell. The curved barbell, because the, the way it can turn, the angle changes, and that causes bumps and irritation. So start with the ring on the doff piercing. And that's about the – oh, septum piercings, too. I'll pierce septums with circular barbells because they can act like – Kind of like a stationary when it's flipped up inside the nose, it can't move around. So therefore, it's more stationary than most other rings. Absolutely. So usually, just just put in the time, heal the stud, and then switch you that know, cool they keep looking. Coming more to be smileys, tongue webs. There's a couple of them like that, but the, the more oil ones where they stay wet and they don't actually attain the crusties are where you don't have as so many problems. But a lot of times, for anything in your nose or most of the stuff in your ears, you're just going to want to put in the time, get the stud healed, pretty much, and then switch. Much. All right. So. So real quickly, a common question, how does one become a piercer? You need to go through an apprenticeship. Find a piercer who's going to teach you the ways of the piercing needle. It's a, a long process. Sometimes it's as little as six months. I think that's kind of a rushed apprenticeship. And sometimes it can be up to a couple of years. So um, it really kind of depends on your mentor, the situation you're in, how long it actually takes. Now, there's things you can do to become a better piercer candidate to becoming an apprentice and that is like taking your bloodborne pathogens course there's some online courses where you can learn about piercings i'm not saying practice piercing at home but try to educate yourself in with anatomy the the terminology understand the metals the the, the fractions the like fractions known fractions and decimals and all those things. It seems know. like that's a big one for beginning people coming in is, is just knowing the different sizes of ring and what order mm -hmm. they're in. And so there's a lot of simple things like that you can learn to become a piercer. Just like you said, the fractions, uh, anatomy, learning all the piercings, and the jewelry types. And that's a good start. But don't start stabbing people before you have that apprenticeship. Absolutely. Because yeah. there's a lot of health reasons. For real, for real. Uh, April wants to know what healing time we can expect on a nostril piercing. Um, under perfect circumstances, probably a month to two months. It may seem healed after a month, but generally you want to give it a minimum of two months before it's pretty fully healed. Now, sometimes these can take up to six months. It depends on lifestyle. If masks are rubbing up against it, you're catching towels, um, you have a dog that's constantly trying to help you clean and licking your nose. There's so many variables. So the better you take your care of your piercing, the quicker it's going to heal. But I would say it could feel healed as soon as a month. Sometimes it's up to six months. Alexandra wants to know, does a belly button piercing hurt a lot? Um, a couple different ways to answer this. Number one, the piercing itself isn't going to be that painful. It's like a shot of the doctor, probably less painful than a shot of the doctor. Just a quick little pinch. Now, if you're getting caught on towels and shirts, your pants are rubbing up against it. So those high-waisted pants are popular right now. And if they're rubbing up against it, it's nothing but problems. So that's the biggest thing you need to be aware of at this point. So it would be pain after the fact. After the fact of, yeah, it's like a bruise. If you're doing something, you're constantly hitting that bruise. Yeah, it hurts. But if you don't touch that bruise, you don't know the pain. Okay, so it's, it's yeah. how you take care of it. Correct. Okay, so Ella has a question. She gets her ears pierced with a needle, but the piercing jewelry has always been an earring with a butterfly back. Is that right or wrong? Should she request or look for something else? What, what are the pros and cons of a butterfly back? <laughs> um, 
In my opinion, yes, it's wrong. Is it against the law? I, I don't. Depends on where you're at. I mean, technically, here in Las Vegas, as a body piercer, I cannot legally pierce with butterfly backs. I'm supposed to use um, the labrets. They have the list of the styles of jewelry that we actually have to use. So there's only certain things I'm allowed to legally use. So I couldn't technically use a butterfly back. Now the problem with a butterfly back is they have these little clasps clasps and there's a lot of area for bacteria and germs to kind of get in there and you can't clean it out so it turns into a bacteria trap so it's that's a problem also it's one size fits all and you clasp it on there nice and tight and it doesn't give room to breathe that's why they're telling you to spin and rotate your jewelry well if you're touching with your hands it's going to get infected and also, you're just irritating it. So get the appropriate size jewelry, something comfortable to sleep on. That butterfly back, that thing constantly digs into the back of your ear, a flat disc is way more comfortable. Now, That's for, anyone that, for anyone that doesn't know, a butterfly back looks like this sort of. This Thank is what you, you're Jared. Talking about. Yes, yes. So it holds tight on the post, but you, there's all those little nooks and crannies where it's going to be hard to clean. Uh-huh. And a lot of times these things go on so tight, they're just way too tight for the ear. Uh, I actually, there's a little girl that came in. I was trying to get some jewelry out of her ear. Her ear completely grew over the top of it. She had to go to the hospital to have it removed. Ah. It sucks. It's, it really sucks, but it does happen. So that's why I go to a professional and have appropriate jewelry put in your ear. All right. Yeah. Uh, what was your parents' view on piercings and tattoos? <laughs> they hated it. Um, <laughs> Are you hated it? So I guess it was one of the reasons why I loved it more. It was something of my own, something that I could kind of claim. Because I was involved with a lot of sports and activities, and they were always very, very supportive of everything. But this was the one thing they kind of steered away from. They're like, no, nah, if you're doing that, you're on your own. And and I, I did it. I, I completely jumped in head over heels with the stuff, and I, I love what I do. Now they love what I do. They, they're very proud of me. They love – I don't know if they would ever get tattoos or piercings, but – but they've come to understand. They appreciate it and they understand it more. And it's funny because my parents will be at a casino and they'll see someone, my dad will see someone with tattoos or piercings. They're like, hey, what's your tattoo say? And you see the kids like, oh, shut up, old man. You know, you don't know. You're like, no, my son's a body piercer. He works at Dada. And he's like, really? You know, it's like he pierced me in Dada. And that's happened here in Vegas a couple of times. So it's almost like opened that world to them. They want to interact with other fun. modified folks. It's really fun. Really fun. Yeah. Very cool. So you change well, your mind a little bit. Yeah. yeah, for sure. For sure. Okay. Next up, we have Bethany. Uh, hi from the UK. Hi, Bethany. And we just want to say thank you so much for your industrial piercing advice in that previous video. She went and got hers pierced yesterday and is loving it. Congratulations. I'm so proud of you. It's, God, I miss getting pierced. I need to get pierced more. Hmm. Happy for you. That's awesome. Good luck on the healing. Just stay off sleeping it. Uh, Lindsay, hi. She says hi to Scott and Jared. Hi, Lindsay. I'm Jared. Uh, has anyone from the <laughs> what can I get pierced, what should I get pierced videos gone on to get the piercing that you've suggested done? I've yes. had a couple people. Yeah, yeah, there's been a couple people. Um, actually had someone not too long ago who came in and she got her vertical of Brett done and uh, she's like, you know why I got this done? And I was just like, I didn't recognize her. And I'm like, no, why? And she's like, you told me I should get a piercing. And I was all excited. I'm like, sweet, it looks great on you. I'm like, you're a perfect candidate for it. So yeah, people have come in. It's been Even come personally to you. Yeah, yeah. And we've gotten comments on the videos from people that go to their local piercer and, and get the uh, suggestions. So yes, excellent. yes, that too. That's fun. All right. Um, Tree Moss says, hey, what's up, Scott? He was there last week with a tool shirt. Uh, what are the I remember you. Yeah. What are the requirements for a nipple piercing? Um, yeah, I have nipples. Is that about it? Huh? <laughs> Hey, nipples and an ID. And an ID that says you're at least 18 years old. Yes, yes, that is true. Um, sometimes people come in, uh, guys will come in with really, really small nipples and they say, oh, I have too small nipples to pierce. The actual nipple, yeah, we might have to go a little bit into the areola, but I had really, really tiny nipples too. I had mine pierced and mine healed up and I still wear mine today. So everyone can get pierced. Um, the only real candidate I'd say that kind of can't is going to be someone who has really extremely inverted nipples because sometimes nipples will actually concave inwards. Um, and the nipple actually doesn't come out it's because tendons and everything are holding it in. So if I can't get access to the nipple, I can't actually pierce it. So it does stay true. If you have nipples, if they're kind of hidden away that you don't. Yeah. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay. Question from Emily Sakuma. If my bridge piercing keeps bleeding, should I be constantly rinsing it with the wound wash spray? Or is it okay to just use plain water to wipe up the blood? 
water should be fine. Um, the constantly bleeding thing kind of concerns me. How, how recently did you get it pierced? And is it bleeding because of crusties? Sometimes we have to put a longer bar in there to accommodate room for swelling. And if the swelling goes down and that bar is moving back and forth and it's scratchy and irritating, then you probably need a shorter bar. And that would probably be the main reason why it's bleeding. But if you've had a pierce a while and it's still just bleeding, you should go talk to your piercer because normally they don't bleed. Try to figure that yeah. out. Yeah. Rowan Emerson wants to know for a tongue piercing, is it okay to use a flexible bioplast post or is that bad? I've never been a fan of the bioplast posts. Um, bioplast is, is like an acrylic. A lot of people say it's medical grade, but the beads generally don't hold in. The, a lot of the bioplast stuff are either press set in or they're an externally threaded with like a steel bead that screws onto the top. So I'm not a fan of it. I would stay away from it, especially for oral piercings, like a tongue piercing where it's completely inside your mouth. For a lip piercing, it's a little bit more understandable because you have the, the plastic on the inside. I understand where you're going with that. But if you just get the appropriate size jewelry, that will not do damage to your mouth and you're not having plastic inside your body. Plastic's generally not very good. So some people argue say that the stuff is safe, but I still don't. I'm not a fan of it. You don't tend to like no. to use it. No, it's a temporary quick fix. Tegan wants to know if I got my double helix at the end of January, uh, will I be able to before summer and will I be able to change it before summer and when can I put hoops in? Okay. Every person heals differently. I'm going to say probably a minimum of maybe six months before you can actually change two hoops. Now, the easiest way to tell is when the swelling's completely gone down. So use your camera phone, take a picture of both your ears. I'm assuming a double helix means two on one side. Once the swelling's gone down and they're close to the same size and they don't have crusties, then you can change to the ring. But if you put the ring in there and if it's, it's going to be sore for a day or two, but if it stays sore for a like week plus, go back to the studs because that means you're not healed up enough. Camilla Alvarez says, hi guys. I hope you're having an amazing Hello. day. Fantastic. Thank you. She's getting a rook and a conch done in the same ear, same day. Mm -hmm. Have any advice for minimizing the pain and accelerating the healing? What do we do? Absolutely. Um, properly care for this once a day with the wound wash spray. Spray directly on there. Paper towels or sterile gauze to wipe off crusties. Less is more. The other thing is, is before you go in there, a good night's sleep. Um, a nice big meal right before you go in so you have you know, a stomach full of food and, that, and a good support team. If you have a friend to bring with you that's going to make you feel more comfortable, bring that friend. But generally, they're not going to be that bad and it's easier to get the two done in one session instead of separating them. So, yeah, good luck to you. I hope you have a wonderful piercing. I hope you have an amazing healing. If you have problems, let us know here. Some positive words from the Wolf of Pencil Tucky. Uh, Excellent. Really appreciates your videos. Looking forward to start stretching uh, their ears. And you've been an absolute wealth of information. Thank you. I'm glad you're uh, being part of our team here. This is great having such a great community because it's fun. Because even when we talk here, I'm giving you guys things. There's other answers going. Like you guys are learning with me here. And it's it's fun to see that. Absolutely. It's super, super fun. Scott's Animals Adventures says, hey, Scott. Hi. How long great. <laughs> does it take a dermal piercing to heal in the face? Um, it's a fine line. Most piercings, you're going to heal that fistula, which is the tubus scar tissue from point A to point B, like enter to exit hole. But, but dermal anchors are different. I'm not a hundred percent sure how they technically heal. They don't encapsulate with the scar tissue the same way. So technically I would say a couple months and they're mostly healed up, but I don't know if they're ever fully, fully healed up because I've had them before and they get irritated from time to time. Some people have them and they seem fully healed up, but they're a different type of piercing. They're, they're always a little volatile. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've had quite an effect on Mitchell, uh, since, uh, since he's been listening to you, he's gotten a septum, a bridge, a nasolang, a trident in the left ear and three eyebrows. Send us a picture. I'd love to see these. Congratulations. A trident. Cool. I wonder if you got the, did you get the double or did you get the actual four, four piercing industrial, Very you know? Cool. Uh, just for fun, wants to know, how do you know if a person has the correct anatomy to pierce certain parts? It, it's the shape of your, you'd have to talk to your piercer about it. Generally, you're looking for a ridge to pierce. Like sometimes a doff piercing, um, like when you're looking at this ear here, this is, it sticks out a little bit, but it's not that much. So it's probably, there's might be a chance of rejection. But then if you have something where it's, 
extremely solid like this, you see how there's a real hard ridge? That's a more pierceable one. So I, I think they're both pierceable, but sometimes belly buttons might be completely flat and there's no natural fold of skin. That's, you know, that's the type of thing we're looking for. It's different for every anatomy, depends on the shape and just if the jewelry would fit in there right. Uh, Ebony wants to know, uh, we have a septum piercing already. What do you think about both nostrils as well? <laughs> the trifecta. I'm a big fan, huge fan. The only reason I don't have my septum jewelry in is because it doesn't fit with the plugs that kind of take up the space of the septum. So bump yeah, each other. The double nostril septum, it's one of my favorite combos. Music media outlets has a doth. And the question is, is that basically death to headphone wearing forever? No. No, you're totally fine. Once you heal it up, these doth piercings sometimes take a long time to heal. Under perfect circumstances, three or four months, but expect six months, maybe nine months before that swelling and everything's so comfortable. You can wear the earphones, earbuds, all those things again. Once you're healed, it's not a problem. It's just getting to that healed point. Be patient. We're going to get to Quinn's question in just a second, but first, Ursula Zods and Ends had a piercer who said denture cleaner is great for cleaning your body jewelry. Is this legit or was he full of it? Okay. Um, I have no idea what denture cleaner actually is. So it's maybe, like a fizzy. Like, so you drop your dentures in a cup and then drop a fizzy thing in there and it effervesces and makes them clean is what I've learned from commercials. I don't actually know. <laughs> Maybe I would have to look into to see how it would affect the titanium or steel. Make sure it but doesn't think about it. Like you. tongue piercing, sometimes you get that plaque buildup on there. If you're able to take your tongue ring out, and put it in there, and clean it, that might clean off all the plaque a lot easier than trying to scrape. And it stands to reason. I don't know. That this, I don't know. Yeah, that it would be body safe because if it's for putting on your teeth, then it would not be bad. It just it depends you. on if that chemicals would erode or cause damage to the metals. Right. I don't know what that is doing there, but if it's just kind of like an ultrasonic cleaner where it's bubbles and fizzy stuff, it should be fine. Not to clean piercings to clean jewelry that means take it out of your piercing and put it in there right so yeah we are not sure but it probably wouldn't be bad yeah might look into that a little bit that's a great question thanks that's for asking very cool it's yeah. nice that you learn things from other piercers i do <laughs> so quinn says hi scott and jared love the channel and learned a lot what's up quinn uh quinn has a question concerning nipple piercings female nipples i don't know if it sure. makes a difference uh wondering about 12 gauge versus 14 for a new piercing because we've read that 12 gauge is ultimately more stable and comfortable and if you choose smaller beads for the 12 would it look similar to a 14 anyway Yes, that's a, it's a great thing. I'm glad you brought this up. When I first started piercing, I did a lot more 12 gauge nipple piercings than I did 14s and they seemed to heal up better and people were more happy and more comfortable. I personally have mine stretched up to either a six or a four gauge. I don't remember, but the larger size is more comfortable. If you think about like a hair, if you grabbed a single hair or a handful of hair, the more surface area you have pulling, the less painful it's going to be. So especially if you're more into like nipple play and if there would be a pulled on something the thin is going to be closer to that cheese cutter now 14 is the minimum i would ever pierce a nipple at and like i said if you're into the rougher nipple play then i would say definitely go larger now the issue is is society has stepped in and said hey 14 is the standard so all of the nipple bars that you're going to see in most companies most of them are going to be in the 14 gauge size now with threadless jewelry and internally threaded, a lot of that 14 gauge stuff is universal between 14 and 12. Uh, the only difference is some jewelry is countersunk, which means how the bead or the bar can go into the bead a little bit, but not a lot of jewelry is that way anymore, it seems like. Less and less of that. So so sometimes it's back and forth. You can use the same heads of jewelry between 14 and the 12, even if you want to stretch up and you already had that 14. So so 12 is better, but you might be limiting your jewelry options. A correct, little. correct. But if you're going threadless style, you have the same gem options as the 14. And the internally threaded is the same concept. So, And like Quinn was asking, when the, when the beads are on the end, you can't really tell the difference between a 12 or a 14 at, by yes. eye. Yes, the, the difference is, is you can't wear the super, super tiny beads on the nipple rings because you're getting closer to the size of the actual bar where that could get pulled inside. Okay. So if you're wearing a slightly larger, like a four millimeter bead, you can still get away 
away with that on uh, and a nipple bar. The look is basically yeah. the same, yeah. aesthetically. And generally, most people wear between a four and a five millimeter with most 14 gauge nipple piercings anyway. I do more of the five millimeter bead, but you could still get away with that four millimeter on a 12 gauge. Okay, so that even that's on the small side for absolutely. a bead. Absolutely, absolutely. Very cool. So hopefully that answers that for you, Quinn. Yeah. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate you. Go 12. Uh, <laughs> Sydney wants to know a question that I think you get asked a lot that's obvious to you, but I don't think is obvious to the viewers. Sure. Since you're a professional piercer, do you ever pierce yourself? Um, I, I have before. I don't enjoy it as much as I normally like getting pierced. I'm a piercing junkie. I've been pierced literally hundreds and hundreds. Of, I think I stopped counting it at 350, maybe it's 400, and that was over... 15 years ago. So I've been pierced a lot. Now I look at getting pierced like a, like getting pampered, like going to a spa and getting a massage and getting the hair and the nails done and all that. Like getting pierced is that for me. Okay. That's my happy place. I love laying down on the table and, you know, and like the eyebrow massage and like the needle going through. And it's just, I'm getting decorated and I'm being. Okay. So, so you'd have to do it to yourself. Kills it the magic. the enjoyment out of it. Plus the other thing, it's like pain isn't really much of a factor for me. I'd rather have the look of it and like kind of the, the rush of the feel of the piercing. But when you're in the mirror, everything's backwards, everything's slower, like trying to get the angles right. It's virtually impossible. So it's easier just having someone else do it. Even as a pro, yeah. you're just not into that. It's tough. It's real tough. I mean, yeah. And that makes sense. Like, because you go to the spa and say, you get like a facial massage. It's like, you, you could massage your own face. Absolutely. <laughs> but, absolutely. <laughs> but there's less enjoyment in laying down on the couch and massaging your own face. I love getting pierced. Very good answer. I like that. All right. So Natalie wants to know, is an industrial harder to heal than a rook? Yes. Um, industrial is kind of stationary and stuck in the one position. Um, basically, for those of you who don't know, an industrial bar, um, industrial piercing is where it's, you're going to be going through two piercings. You go, it's the bar that goes across the ear just like this. Now, you're healing one, two piercings with one bar. And when you're sleeping on it, your ear needs to twist, but that bar doesn't allow it to. And that's why industrials take forever to heal. If you're not sleeping on it, it's not being bumped or hit, comb, hair's not getting caught in there, then you can be healed in three to four months. Is that likely? Not very likely at all. Expect six months to a year. Now, the rook, if you can pierce with a curved barbell, you can almost sleep on that side sooner than most piercings because it's tucked inside the ear. Your helixes are being hit on the pillow, but that rook has that layer of helixes and other cartilage to protect it before it's being irritated. So rooks should heal way faster than an industrial. All right. And it kind of makes sense, one piercing versus two. Correct, correct. All right, so Z Knoll has a question. It says, this is a hard one to explain, but luckily you have giant ears. I think you're going to be able to do it. Uh, cool. Does a flat piercing need to be on a completely flat part of the ear, or is it okay if it's slightly rounded? I want one, but I have a, a hilly flat. Great question, and yes, I can answer that because I have the ears. Now, what we're talking about is the flat. Now, you notice how there's not a lot of ridges and it seems pretty flat up in this area? This is the traditional flat that we're talking about. And the nice thing about flat piercings, you can put a large piece of jewelry that sits flat against the ear. Now, if you had an ear, like he's talking about here, where it has this bigger curves or hills in the middle, you can't put as big of a flat of a surface thing because there's going to be the flat's going to go over the edge and you're going to have things hanging off. So you would just have to wear a slightly smaller piece of jewelry. Now, another thing to keep in mind is you might have seen people getting this anti-helix thing pierced where you have three kind of going up that direction. This is technically almost like a flat area, but we're just kind of following the curvature of the ear. So it just kind of limits yourself on the jewelry um, and the placement. So yes, you can still get it done. It would, it would generally have to be at like the top of one of those hills. It'd have to be an area where the, the jewelry's going to sit flat. Now, when you have a hill like this, you're going to want to pierce at the peak. If you pierce at the side, you're going perpendicular, so that gem is going to be all sitting kind of weird. sitting weird and not pointing in the right direction. So you kind of want to go at the peaks of the hill so the jewelry sticks out and people can see what you're trying to... Or the, the bottom of the hill if there was a flat spot there, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Yeah, you could technically do both sides, I suppose, and like decorate both sides of that hill. That so, might be kind of... I don't know. So, yeah. so it works no matter what your ear is if you can find a flat spot. Correct. Cool. You're going perpendicular or 90 degrees to the tissue is what we're trying to do. All right. Next up, we have Jasmine White uh, has had a conch for two months with a barbell in it. Do you have to downsize? 
you don't have to downsize. Um, if it's not causing problems and it seems like it's healing good, you're totally fine. Um, normally, it's the helixes, the ones appearing through the thinner cartilage, where the jewelry is going to start migrating and changing to different angles. Your conch is a little bit thicker, so therefore, it's a little bit more stationary. Now, if that bar is way long, it's just going to be more comfortable with the smaller one. But if do, it's not bothering you, go. If it's not do, broken, don't fix it. Do conches swell a lot? Do you put a big oversized bar in them usually? Yes, they do swell, and I do always oversize the bar. Um, and it just depends on comfort level. You know, a lot of it's sleeping. If you have a ball back there or if the disc or if something seems to be digging in, a shorter one pulls it away so it doesn't dig in. That's kind of all you're really looking for there. So it might make it more comfortable, but if you're not having a problem, don't worry about it. Correct. Cool, cool. Uh, Sevda hopes we're both well, and I think we are. I'm doing pretty swell. Fantastic. Thanks for asking. All right. Uh, how do you recommend that someone gets both traguses pierced? Uh, Love Attraction wants to know. Do you want to go one at a time, or do you want to do both at the same time? Traguses are tricky. Sometimes people can sleep on them right away. Sometimes they can't. Um, my personal opinion is maybe get one side done and see if you're sleeping on that side. If you can sleep on that side and it's not causing problems, it's not causing irritation, go for the other side some people can't sleep on it at all and if you got both your sides done that means you're stuck either on your face or flat on your back and if you're okay with that go for both sides but generally i like to give myself a side to sleep on okay here's an interesting question i'm not sure if there's an easy way to tell just for fun wants to know how you can tell the difference between real titanium jewelry and like fake bad metal jewelry pop metal bad jewelry like is there a way to kind of identify what you're looking at it's not like one's magnetic, the other's not. I mean, I've been doing it a long time. I can kind of look and tell you roughly what the metal almost looks like because niobium has a slightly different look than steel as as titanium. titanium. So it's, it's really, really tough. I remember back in the day, someone had ordered a, a platinum barbell. Oh, wow. Okay. It was really expensive. And we also had some anatomy metal surgical stainless steel barbells with a high polish. The only difference I could see was the weight. Oh, wow. So they looked very similar, platinum yes. and steel. From a $20 barbell to, I think at the time, it was like a four or $500 barbell. Wow. And it was just like, yeah, th there's a lot more weight to the platinum. But like you mix those up and I wouldn't be able to tell. Interesting. It was crazy. It kind of makes sense because you always hear about platinum being a super valuable metal, but you don't actually see it used a lot in jewelry. Yeah. It yeah. must so not be that pretty. I, last time I remember, it's four times the price of gold. Wow. So just rarity not based. cheap. And it looks like steel. It has, a, I think white gold has a better luster than the platinum. And what they use platinum and things like that. I, I don't know if they use platinum, but I know they use palladium for the white gold to kind of get that, that color to it. So, but at least as one test, titanium should never be magnetic. Correct. That would indicate uh, steel or iron is, is in it in some, some way. Uh, I, I'm not a big believer that there's good titanium and necessarily bad titanium. There's the way it's treated, the way it's polished. Um, pure titanium should be totally fine. The titanium, the ASTM F136 stuff, has a couple other metals in there. It's not pure, but it's like 99 whatever percent pure or something like that. And it's just for the structure and integrity of the metals. So, All right, so um, it should be fine. Yeah, It, it is sort of tough to tell, yeah. basically, yeah. on that. You have to come with a reputable source. That's the best way to know. Sometimes in your malls, you'll see stuff labeled, you know, it's like it's going to be steel or it's going to be titanium but you're seeing color, like a colored metal, like a bright orange. Like, I've never seen that color before. It's, it's painted on there. <laughs> and you don't want that. And that's bad metal. Yeah. All right. So Alfie has a problem. The 10 millimeter ear tunnels that he wears mm -hmm. slip out really easily, and he's been losing them without even noticing. Is there something you can do to retain them from slipping and falling out? Um... I'm guessing they're probably steel and they might be heavy. So maybe find some lighter weight, like some titanium tunnels that, you know, they're not going to pull down and stretch as much. Um, maybe if you can take these out at night and put in silicone plugs so your ears aren't being stretched. I don't know if you sleep with them in, but sometimes some people's ears are super, super stretchy and they just naturally stretch. Um, so maybe you need to go up to the next size, but if you keep wearing the heavier ones, they're just going to keep stretching. So it's more about finding the lightweight stuff. Maybe find some wooden plugs to wear for a while so the weight isn't kind of hanging down on there and they can kind of shrink and get more relaxed again. So, it, so it's basically his lobes are getting bigger. 
and the because of the weight of the jewelry, most correct, likely. Correct, correct. That, that would be my guess. But, I mean, I've seen some people wear, like, silicone plugs, and their ears are just so loose, and those things start falling out. So, I mean, everyone's ears are different. You mm-hmm. might have super stretchy ears. Right. So try to find jewelry that doesn't do it or just keep sizing up, I mm-hmm. suppose. Is yeah. One solution. Go big. All right. Dancing Leaf wants to know, is there teeth erosion when using a hoop as jewelry instead of a, a stud and a central librette? Do you ever recommend a hoop and a librette? Yeah. Um, it's annoying for drinking glasses, like like in a fork every time it goes up against there. Now, typically your lip kind of curls out a little tiny bit. You know, it kind of comes out that way. So where we normally do the librette with the ring is – is almost pulling away from the teeth. So if you're doing this and you're biting down on it, yeah, you're going to mess up your teeth. But if you had a labret in there, you're still doing the same damage. So don't play with it, and you should be totally fine. Now, if you have a, a smaller lower lip and that piercing's really deep and it rubs up against it, yeah, take it take it out. <laughs> but a normal labret piercing, normally it doesn't rub up against the teeth. All right. Is it normal for, a, is it normal for a four-year-old helix to flare up sometimes? Yeah, sure. Piercings all can flare up. Um, maybe a little personal and weird, but my nipples get real weird right before I get sick. They just get a little sensitive, and it's like, oh, what did I do to irritate these? And then I just pop on the vitamin C, and I listen to my body. It tells me I'm getting sick, so I kind of hop on that right away. Um, piercings, just the minor irritation can cause an extra irritation for a week to do a couple weeks afterwards. So once in a while that happens. I know sometimes women, when they're on their uh, cycle, sometimes piercings will flare up too. Interesting. So, so yeah. lots of different things. A lot of variables. Them. Stress is even a bad factor. So, so chill out, people. Les the Legend says hello. Uh, What's up, Les? Les is getting an ambulance done on the third, and your video sealed the deal. You're the reason. Congratulations. That is awesome. Ampling is a, it's a wicked piercing. It's probably one of the favorite ones I ever had. Kelly Dusk has an interesting question, a little more technical. What are the advantages and disadvantages of piercing free-handed versus using a clamp? And for anyone that doesn't know, what are we talking about? Let me grab a tool here to kind of show you what we're talking about. The clamp or the forceps we're talking about are like these. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but there's like a little hole in the middle there. And a lot of times we'll line our two dots up. This will just kind of hold the tissue so we can do the piercing, sometimes faster, sometimes to hold it a little bit. Um, I have a lot of opinions on, on clamps. I think they're great, and I think they can be horrible, and it depends on the situation. You, a piercer should be flexible to give the piercee the best situation they can possibly give. If I put a clamp on something and it's hurting them, maybe I need to look at the receiving tube or do the freehand piercing. Now, if I'm going to do a freehand piercing and there's going to be a lot of movement and I'm not going to be able to do it as fast and secure as with the clamp, then go to the clamp. Um, there are some piercers out there who are lazy who are going to be like, I'm only going to do the freehand because I don't want to clean all those tools at the end of the night. Um, find a different piercer if that's the case because you don't want a lazy piercer. Find someone who's going to give you the best experience. I'm not afraid to open up extra tools, clean extra tools, and do what I need to do to make things the most accurate and least painful and the best experience I can give. So a lot of piercers are very anti because they say they can really traumatize the skin, but I only put a rubber band on here tight enough to hold the, t- the tissue steady. Um, there's also piercers out there who put the clamps on so tight because they're like, oh, it takes the pain away. No, it's causing a whole lot more pain than what actually happens, so it just kind of camouflages it, but there's no reason to cause extra pain. So does that kind of answer the question, Jared? I kind of went in a big... Loop. Yeah, I think, I think you do. It kind of It's sort of situational, but, but someone should be able to do both. Yeah, yeah. Work with what... I you should have all the tools at your disposal you know it's i had a piercer one time come up to me a good friend of mine and he was teaching his piercer to do everything without any tools you should be able to do everything i'm like hey do you use a remote control for your tv because you technically don't need to you know you can go up there and turn your tv on and off and move back and forth and he was just like i'm like tools make the job easier sometimes we got the tools at our disposal might as well use them and not like have some kind of ego about it correct all right. Uh, what's a piercing you'd never do? Um, I don't do cheek piercings. I'm just not a fan after the whole Elaine Angel thing where she can kind of leak saliva out of there. The salivary glands migrate into that area. They can be problematic, bite down. Just not a fan of it. So I won't do that one. Um, I won't do the Princess Albertina. And, yes, I will do a video on that that piercing. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a female genital piercing that goes in the urethra and out the vagina. It's pretty intense. 
Wow. Intense. I won't do that one. Coming in a future video. Yeah. And I won't actually pierce the clit itself. A lot of women say I have my clit pierced. 99.9% .9 of them have their hood pierced, and that's what we normally pierce. If you pierce the actual clit itself, it can actually cause a lot of irreversible damage. Absolutely. All right, Joanna, just a positive story. Love your Q&As. Uh, Joanna recently went with th uh, her friends, three 33-year-old ladies, to went and go get some piercings. Uh, and they're glad they did it now and not 17 years ago. So Yeah, times have changed so much. Needles are sharper. Um, we have more experience as piercers. Everything about it is a better situation. Even just the migration from going from steel to titanium makes things heal better. So congratulations. Arda says, hello from Turkey. Hi, uh, Turkey. I think. Is that a first from us? Uh, might be. Yeah. Might be. Cool. Uh, we recently stretched uh, our septum up to a zero, and it's still sore. Yes. It's been three days. Is there any useful <laughs> tips for the soreness? What can we do? Um, patience and keep those crusties off there. Uh, zero is a big step. Um, I don't know how long you waited and how painful it was for it to go in, but sometimes it takes weeks for things to calm down. I wore a two gauge comfortably in my septum for many years i got it up to the zero and i was never able able to comfortably wear the zero because i think my sweet spot was just a little bit too small so um but three days in you need to give it some more time just be patient and keep the crusties off there what are your thoughts on spider bites on a 14 year old rar wants to know the youngest age I'm going to pierce on is going to be 16. I'm not a fan for oral piercings like that because they will leave visible scars. And at 14, it's it's tough to know what you're really doing with your life. You don't really want to scar up your face too much. So that's 16 is a little it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. It yeah. is tough. It's not a dangerous thing to do. It's just going to leave scars. And I don't want to be responsible for Right. You don't necessarily know. Uh, have you ever done a piercing that has gone wrong? Can you tell us a horror story that you've witnessed or experienced? <laughs> um, I've been a part of my high nostril piercings. I don't know if I said this or told the story or not, but there are arteries which run a little higher up in the nostril area. And um, I'm a piercer. We're a different breed. And I decided and kind of made the other piercer pierce it at a 14 gauge, which I will never do now because we found that artery. Um, when I actually pierced it, I was laying down and I could, she's like, oh, you're bleeding a lot. And like, I could feel the back of my throat. Like I had to spit it out. It was quite a bit, but we got the jewelry in there and it stopped for the time being. And then a day or two later, um, it started bleeding again and I got it to stop. And then a day later it started bleeding again. So I was like, I went in and once we took the jewelry out, it was pulsating and shooting. The blood was pulsating and shooting out of my nose. Ah. And, uh, Derek, and I remember Derek putting the pressure on the gauze, and it's like, hold the blood, like, hold the gauze, I need more gauze. And Mike was like, how much gauze? He's like, all of it, just dump all of it. And, and my <laughs> sick ass was laughing so hard, I thought I wasn't going to die. And it was just a panicky, crazy move. And yeah, so there's arteries in the high nostril area, so be careful, don't pierce too big. <laughs> more story, there you go. All of the gauze. <laughs> all of the gauze, just dump the whole tray out. <laughs> so, the whole jar. Kelly H. wants to know, do dermal piercings on the back take a long time to heal? Um, yeah, uh, there's a lot of movement, bending, your pants are rubbing up against it, seats, um, chairs. So they're, they're tough to heal. I would say expect six months before they're completely healed, maybe even up to a year. And they're kind of problematic. You got to be careful and aware of the marking of where the piercings are compared to your pants. If they're constantly rubbing up against it, it's going to be nothing but problems. Alexander wants a similar question. What's the worst thing that's ever happened when you pierced someone else? Um, I'm a piercer. I've lost connections and had to re-pierce people before. Um, Do the people ever like pass out or freak out? Do you have that kind of, of reactions ever? I've seen all that. that. That comes with the territory. I think the worst thing for me is doing a piercing and having it coming out crooked, missing a connection, and have to look him right in the face and say, I messed up. I need to re-pierce it. I can't find your piercing hole. I can't, you know, it's, I'll give you a discount. I'm sorry. It, it happens. We're all human, you know, but that's why I like to use as many tools as I need to eliminate the chance of those things happening. Make sure you're so, doing the best you can. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Because you don't want to have to look someone in the face and be like, yeah, that hurt. And you don't have a nice piercing yet. So we're going to do it again. Correct. Correct. <laughs> correct. Wow. 
Uh, so, is there any way to prevent teeth damage with snake bites? Yeah. Um, shorten your bars. Uh, when you get a chance, make sure they're not rubbing up against your teeth, your gums. And if you have that short, flush barred labret in your lip, um, you shouldn't have any problem. So, um, if it's rubbing up there and you're constantly hitting it, you're going to do damage, then you need to take them out. All right. Amani K has a question. Uh, got her belly button pierced, and she heard it's not supposed to be dark, but it's fully healed, and there's still, like, a dark spot there. Is that normal? Yeah, sometimes it does happen. Um, it's, it's Everyone scars differently, and I've seen it before. Like, if you take the piercing out and you decide to retire your piercing, I know Mederma and scar tissue remover pulls all that dark, discolored scar tissue away. I honestly don't know how to really get rid of it while wearing the piercing. Okay. So might it go away on its own with time? Maybe a little bit, but generally I don't see that. What, that's why I like when I do the initial piercing, like if I'm re-piercing someone, all that dark discolored tissue needs to go away. Otherwise, when you pierce it, it stays there. So I, tune in in a couple of weeks. I'm going to do my homework on that one. I'm going to see if there's a way to get rid of dark scar tissue while wearing the jewelry. Maybe emu oil could work on that. I, I I really don't know. All right. So we'll do a little research for you, Armani, and see what we can find out. All right. Ice Luzi says, I got my uvula piercing today and thought I'm going to swallow a needle. (laughs) Sorry if I scared you that way, but congratulations on your piercing. And for those of you who don't know what a uvula piercing yeah, there's a video about it. Yeah, there's a little punching ball in, like in the back of your throat, that thing hanging back there. That's the uvula. Now, when this piercing is done, normally the needle needs to be shortened or get the shortest possible, and it's all done with tools in like the back of the throat. So look it up on the internet. It's pretty awesome. Um, it's a very dangerous piercing. You need to have an extremely skilled piercer. I personally won't do this piercing either because there's always that small risk of losing the needle. Right. And yeah. And how does one check their bead tightness? Um, most of the time, these ones are done with rings. Okay. Um, I've never really seen a barbell in there. Um, most of the time, they're done with uh, seam rings, so the ring's like to the side. Right. So you're able to do the piercing, slide the ring through, and then you take some hemostats and you can bend it. So it's not going to fall out. Yeah, there's no way to check that. You that's the, Yeah. <laughs> awesome piercing. I can't imagine it was very painful. Let me know. Let me know. I'm curious. Uh, so Andy wants to know, we got a conch piercing five weeks ago, and, like, the area around it is super itchy. Is that normal? Yep. Um, your body's still in the healing process, and that's all those white blood cells rush into the party area to start the healing process. So it, it, it's going to be itchy. It's, Try not to touch it. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh. a nasty game the body plays. Like, says, hey, itch me, but... You're not supposed to do it. <laughs> All right. Bat Dad Singo says, hello from Pennsylvania. Hi. Uh, looking to get nostril piercings on both sides. What are the best tips for cleaning it so they stay crust-free inside of the nose? And thanks, guys, for being awesome. Absolutely. Um, the best way to use, the best thing to use is a wound wash spray, which is sterile saline solution in a can. Um, you might not be aware, like, a lot of squirt bottles will have the full stream and the mist you're going to want to find the fine mist one. A full stream one is going to be kind of harsh and tough to spray up your nose. You just spray a little bit on the outside, a little bit on the inside, and let the solution soften any of the like, little dried crusties. And then you can take out like a paper towel or a piece of gauze and just gently wipe away those crusties. Once a day is generally enough, sometimes twice if it needs, needs it, but um, don't overdo it. And less is more. The biggest thing is watch out for towels. You may think you're careful on how you wipe your face, but everyone gets it caught and yanks on it, and it sucks. I'm sure everyone who has a nostril piercing can attest to that. Because that can happen to everybody. Yeah. All right. Julia Oliveira wants to know, when getting a smiley piercing, does the size of your gums matter? Um, maybe. Um, it's an anatomy-dependent piercing. If your gums kind of stick out and your smiley's back in and the, the ring's going to be rubbing up against your gums, then you're going to get gum erosion. You're going to have some problems. If you can get that smiley to kind of rest out away from your gums and kind of hang down more, that's the way when I do the marking. Is it generally minimizes a little bit of the damage, but I would have to see to actually know. Rodney Wilhelm wants you to do a video on the dolphin piercing for men. So that one's in the pipe. That is actually coming. Yes, yes. That's one of the few I've never done. And honestly, I've never even seen one before. 
And for those of you who are curious what a dolphin, it's it's a prettier name <laughs> where you're thinking it is. It's a male genital piercing where you take the Prince Albert, which goes in the urethra and out the bottom of the head. This hole is now stretched up, large enough where I can put a receiving tube further in, so it's like a double Prince Albert. So it's not like you wear a ring in the front, you wear a curved barbell or a ring in the middle of the shaft coming down from the urethra to the urethra. Very interesting. Pretty intense. Like I said, I've never seen one, but uh, yeah. Theoretically, they exist. Yes. All right. Jumping in uh, out. <laughs> Haley wants to know if we should be worried about the white bump on the left side of my tongue web piercing. It was pierced on the 8th of January and otherwise healing well, but we got this little white bump. Sometimes that happens. That's that fistula. Um, for a tongue web, a lot of times that thing is so thin that when you develop that fistula, it almost gets wider than the thickness of that web, so sometimes it sticks out a little bit. That might be what you're seeing. If it's a hard bump off to one side, that could be an irritation bump and will probably go away after a little bit longer. Just give it some time and uh, try not to play with it. If you if you have a bar in there or a ring and you're pulling on it, that could be irritation causing that little uh, scar tissue bump or irritation bump to form. So don't play with it. Miriam Islam got a nose pierced with a 16 gauge. Is that good? Is that the size you recommend? Um, it's not the size I recommend, but there is nothing wrong with that. The only thing wrong with a 16 gauge nostril piercing is your limitations of jewelry. Um, almost all nostril jewelry is going to be coming in, um, 18 gauge, except for the threadless stuff. So if you have a threadless push pin, then you can wear the 16 with no problem. So you can even wear all the way up to like a 12 gauge. I think we can get threadless jewelry in now. So very cool. All right, congratulations to B. Uh, they're getting their first piercing tomorrow, a septum. Congratulations and have fun. Ethereal Goddess wants to know if you have any tips for aftercare on double high nostrils. We're thinking about getting them done. <laughs> double high nostrils. I'm guessing you're talking one on each side. I've never seen a double on one. I don't even know if I could do a double on one oh, side. See, that now be, some poor now victim. You got me thinking. Now you got me thinking here. Um, Get oversized bars. They're going to swell. Um, they're going to swell crooked. They'll go back to normal. Um, as far as the, it's awkward to get. It's not that bad to clean. Um, you're just going to be using the wound wash spray to keep this, you know, to keep the crusties off there. Spray the, the wound wash way up your nose is a little uncomfortable, but you get used to it. But having all those tools up your nose is the worst part. But they're a beautiful look. They look so cool. I love them, obviously. <laughs> Big fan. Uh, Don says, love you. Uh, Thanks, Don. Love you, too. Miri really wants to get a septum and lobes pierced. Is it a good idea to do everything at once, or is there a, a separate times thing that's better to do? I'd say go for it. Um, lobes are really, really easy to heal. Uh, typically, you're going to be healed up in within a month or so, um, technically six to eight weeks, but most people are comfortable within that month. Septum, same kind of thing. It's They're both easy to heal. Neither of them are really going to stop you from sleeping on one side or the other. And, uh, yeah, go for it all. Might as well heal them all up at the same time. So Leah had a problem, and I think a lot of people probably have. Uh, wanted to get a brow piercing, went into the piercer, and the piercer says, your skin's too thin for that piercing. Is there any possibility she can still get one? Is there like a loophole or maybe a similar piercing? What do you think? If your skin is too thin, you don't have the right anatomy, it's just going to reject out. Like, um, I don't know if you can see this, but I have some thick tissue here. And it's really maneuverable, and a half of mine have rejected out. The other half have been fine. So the tighter that skin is, the thinner it is. If your bone's pushing out on it, I wouldn't do it. It's just going to leave a big scar, and you'll just have the piercing for maybe a month or two. Now, even if you're not a candidate for a standard eyebrow piercing, is it possible you could get like a horizontal, like a surface bar piercing or something? Or is, is skin if, thick? If it's that tight, and that it's going to just reject out. Same problem, yeah, really. Yeah. So really sucks but it's a very anatomy dependent piercing if it's tight and thin it's not gonna work so what happens if leah just keeps shopping piercers until she finds someone who's willing to pierce it what's going to happen to her eyebrow like what does it look like when you pierce it will probably like look great for a couple days and then it's just going to stay red and it'll never look healed and it's gonna be less and less tissue until it probably rejects all the way out and that's when you see people who have that like bald yeah. line in their eyebrow yeah, where the like hair doesn't grow. Yeah, like there's an area where the skin just, the hair just doesn't grow there anymore. So, And that's and because of a scar. A lot of times it's an indent too. So it can leave a really big scar. So it's not yeah. something to play around with. It's not like yeah. maybe just try it out. It's I just would, set your sights on yeah, a different piercing. Yeah, yeah. And keep this in mind. Us piercers, 
make money off doing piercings, we're turning away money. That should say something. Right. That they're obviously have your best interest in mind because they'd rather just take your 50 bucks. Absolutely. That's money in their pocket. And if you're saying, no, I don't want your money. I don't want to sky. I don't want to feel guilt. I mean, that's saying something. Mm-hmm. If there's a couple people saying this, there's probably some truth to it. You want to trust them. Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. They're yeah. obviously not taking advantage of you. Yeah. There's people who will take your money. Keep looking. You'll find them. But it's not the best idea. <laughs> All right. Uh, Rocco had uh, their nipples pierced several times only to get really funky after after one year, uh, will scar tissue be a problem re-piercing? So I assume we mean we've hit, we had them pierced, we had some problems with them, we took them out. Mm-hmm. Can we get them re-pierced, or is the scar tissue in there from the first time going to be trouble? Um, Rocco, I would say that get rid of the scar tissue as best you can with Mederma or a scar tissue remover. I mean, you're going to kind of massage and like play around with your nipples for a little bit, but that will break down the scar tissue. If your nipples were really pierced deep into the areola before, that's probably why they got funky and they take forever. They don't ever heal right and it kind of lifts that scar tissue. But if you get rid of the scar tissue and you get it pierced closer to the base of the nipple and the areola, um, you still should be able to get pierced. Just get rid of the scar tissue and you should heal it up just fine. If you reject it all the way out, uh, uh, your piercings from before, then they're tough to get repierced. But if there's a scar tissue, get rid of the scar tissue and then get them repierced. While we're on the subject, we'll stay there. Damani asks if you had a nipple piercing for years and then took them out, uh, and some fluid will squeeze out. Why does this happen? Is this normal? Yes. Um, You've heard the term a lot is fistula. You heal that tubus scar tissue through there. When we do the piercing, we don't remove tissue. You're making a crescent incision, push it off the side, and then it heals in that position. But the rest of your body is trying to push it back to the closed position. So sometimes the holes don't necessarily completely seal, but they will shrink small enough to where you can't get jewelry in there. But it's small enough where dead skin cells, the shampoos, soaps, oils will get in there. And it's almost like a pocket for like a pimple where you can almost get that white, you can almost pop it off. Squish of it. that so, stuff out. Yeah, so that, that does happen. All right. And it's generally just like natural stuff for the most yep. part. Not really a concern. No nope. reason to freak out. No, nope, no. Nope. But if you like really squeeze, sometimes you can make it like a pimple and pop that white stuff on. It seems gross, but it's, that's all it is. Uh, annoying fan has a good recommendation. Got both traguses done and used one of those U-shaped neck pillows to sleep on while they heal to keep that weight off the ear. So that's smart. Awesome. You're not annoying at all. Thank you for the good advice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So Bridget or Bridget, uh, I just got my eyebrow pierced in July. I still have pus and it itches a bit and I'm scared it might be rejecting. When slash if should I take it out? Ah, that sucks. That has taken this long. Um, I'm going to ask what you're doing about taking care of it. Hopefully you're not putting any oils, tea tree oils, things like that. Less is generally more. Just that wound wash spray once a day to keep the crusties off there. Um, it, what kind of metal do you have in there? If it's steel, maybe change the titanium because the lightweight titanium um, will actually help quite a bit. Um, if the bar seems like it is getting longer um, or if it seems like less skin, then I would say take it out. But take a picture of it this week, next week, and the week after and see how they look from week to week. Day to day, it's really hard to judge how things are doing. And you'll say that like the little patch of skin will appear to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Correct, correct, from week to week. And then the other thing is if you really inspect your eyebrow and you look, you might see a trail of scar tissue where it used to be. And if you can see that little white line behind each one, that means it's rejecting. It's slowly yeah, working its way out. So, Get it out of there. Yeah, yeah. So, um, But the, the pus coming out of there, I'm not sure what you're doing. Don't touch, rotate it, spin it, just... Try to leave it be, and hopefully you have the barbell too. All right. So Christopher wants to know, how long do we have to wait to change a tongue piercing? Generally, I tell tongue piercing, I'm assuming it's the normal uh, vertical through the center of the two muscles there. Um, I tell people two weeks, as long as the swelling's gone down, you can downsize to a shorter pulse so you don't do damage to your teeth. If it's still swollen or irritated, you definitely want to wait longer. As far as wearing plastic or other types of fancier styles of jewelry, give it at least a month, month and a half. Delara has a question. Hi, Scott. Hi. How do I get rid of a moisture bump on my rook despite always drying it with a hair dryer? Uh, everything, it's wet. So a moisture bump. What do we like? Is this happened where Sometimes like it, it seems to weep? Yeah, a little bit. Um, 
Would you dry it with a hair dryer or is that not the best way? It's not necessarily bad unless it's getting hot and you're irritating it that way. So I would say just like the wound wash spray. Um, if you're using hair dryer, maybe there's hair products getting there. There's something else that might be causing the irritation. Figure out why the irritation is being there. Make sure you're rinsing out shampoos, conditioners. If you're using any sort of hair product that's getting in there, you need to kind of protect it and not let that get in there. Clean it once a day with the wound wash. Um, and I, when you say clean piercings, I don't think people always understand that there can be actually like junk stuck on the shaft of your piercing. And so you want to clean that off and make it smooth again. Yes. Right? Yes, exactly. Thank you, Jared. Your bar or jewelry that they put in you has a polish on there. And that's so it's smooth so your jewelry can move back and forth. The reason your jewelry can't move when it's healing is because you have crusties adhered and stuck to it. Now, if you know what I'm talking about, like a rasp or a file has all those little tiny micro beads and like to do your nails to kind of scrape it off. Imagine turning your bar into one of those nail files. That's what all those crusties are. So if it's not, if you're not cleaning, spraying, soaking, getting those crusties soft and wiping them off, it's irritating, and when it scratches, that's going to cause any of the little pus and the wetness to possibly happen to it. Sometimes it's a chemical thing. Sometimes it's an irritation thing. Um, but, yeah, find your way to get rid of the source of the irritation. Clean it properly. And you can use a hair dryer, but just generally a paper towel or clean gauze might work, too. If Alexandra gets a belly button piercing on Friday, <clears throat> will we be okay to swim in the ocean by summertime, like June, July? Okay, belly button piercings, yes, you can totally go swimming because there's tagaderm patches, which is like a waterproof Band-Aid. Kind of looks like a piece of clear saran wrap that sticks to your skin. So you can go swimming, and this will protect your piercing. Now, the thing is, is it's technically an open wound for a minimum of one month. You're going to have crusties during the whole healing process, but if it seems pretty healed, you don't have a lot of crusties, and you're probably fine after a month to go in without causing irritation. Now, if it got recently bumped and it bled, it's an open wound again, and you need to be aware of that. The longer you wait, the less of a chance of irritation. Now, oceans, rivers, and lakes are the biggest concerns because people could get a staph infection. So if it's still within a month to maybe a couple months, it's not a bad idea to go get one of those little patches to protect it. But at four months... You're probably pretty cool you should to jump in and swim. But if at three months, you know, and, you know, you tore weeks, it on a towel. Yeah, and exactly. It's now an open wound again. Okay. So, so, yeah. so as long as things feel good, you should be all right, Alexandra. And keep this in mind. This also goes for cuts on your arms. If you just had a huge cut on your arm and stitches and going in the water, it's the same risk or concern. Doctors will say, don't get it wet. Don't, you know, wait till it completely seals and closes back up. So, so, so kind of yeah. think about that with everything. Not just, just your piercing. It's not just a piercing. A fresh tattoo is a terrible idea to go into an ocean. Oh, I'd imagine. There's oh. a lot of entry yeah. points in your skin yeah. there. Yeah. All right. Uh, Jaden wants to know, both tragus is pierced at one time or one at a time? It. I say one at a time. Once you can sleep on this side without irritation, go ahead and do the other side. If you can sleep on your face or your back, go for both. But you'll be stuck on either your face or your back if you get both done normally. Hermit Crab says, hi, Scott. Hi. I have pointed ears naturally, and I'm not sure what piercings would suit them. Do you have any recommendations? Um, pointed ears naturally. Sometimes putting um, a little spike on the top, you know, if you wanted to accentuate that spike Pretty or that little cool. point on your ear. Um, you can also do, like, maybe a V industrial where we bend a 90-degree angle. So instead of going straight across, you know, you have the V up this way and you kind of create the diamond. That's kind of I mean, cool. There's some fun things you can do with it. Do a series of helix piercings going down from that V. Uh, if you wanted to stay away from that, you could also do some lower things to kind of bring the tension away from the pointy part of your ear, like work more on the lobes, the tragus conch area. Very cool. Depends on what, what you want to do with it. And that's why it's nice to get a, a good professional piercer who you can kind of like work out a plan with, you know, style yeah, the ear. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people get piercings to bring attention to areas they like. This is one of the reasons people throughout all cultures have gotten pierced. If you have a beautiful nose, let's get my nose pierced so I can bring attention. Beautiful eyes, go to that eyebrow. Just, it's going to bring attention to the most attractive part of your body. And that's the reason why a lot of people get pierced. So if you don't want a lot of attention to that point in the ear, don't get a piercing at the top of your pointy ear. Or if you do, if you like your pointy ear, check this out. My ears are it. different than everyone. I mean, people pay a lot of money to have these elf ears made now. So right. you got it naturally, it's in your blood. All right. <laughs> 
Erica asks, what can I pair with a Medusa and a septum? Because I want to be symmetrical. And we were thinking about a bridge, but we have glasses. Um, you can still be symmetrical if you get other piercings like double eyebrow, uh, snake bites. Um, you, you know, there's a lot of angel bites. You can do a vertical labret if you wanted to go that route, a normal labret. And it would be a type of symmetry to go maybe like a lip on one side and an eyebrow on the opposite side for like diagonal. Yeah, symmetry. yeah. Is it asymmetry? Is that how or they're kind of... Asymmetrical symmetry? So you kind of do like that kind of a deal? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, there's ways to be... Ba- I call it balanced. Okay. You know, one on the left, one on the right. You know, it's... I like so that. It's balanced and they're symmetrical, so... All right. Uh, Alex flipped a week old septum down for a picture and it felt kind of tight around the tip of the his nose. Uh, got it done with an eight millimeter ring. Will we get used to that over time or should we get bigger jewelry? Um, first of all, it's it was how many days or a week? Uh, so it was a week old septum and it had been up the whole time. A lot of times like your septum can swell a little bit and you're swelling on the bottom part, not the part you actually. So that might be a little bit tighter. Um, I don't know if who did the piercing, if they adjusted the jewelry, but sometimes it can be adjusted. If it seems too tight, we can open it up just a little tiny bit for them. So. But a, a week is kind of early to tell. You should expect it's it to be tight. It's, it's going to be tight. It's going to be a little tender. Yeah. You can have like a little pain. You know, I've heard people talk about being able to poke the tip of their nose and get a spike of pain for Absolutely. quite a long time. Yeah, push up like a pig or kind of down and you just feel that pinch and and that does go away so yeah a little bit of time congratulations on your piercing all right millie just wants to say hey scott thinking about getting some snake bites to go with the nostril piercing we already have sweet uh sydney wants to know are there any piercings you don't have that you want more um I used to have the nape of my neck. I'm planning on getting those done. Um, I'm totally getting my mantis piercings done with some studs, and I want them to heal with some nice, tight, snug gold rings once it's all healed up. I think that would look super, super dope. Um, I definitely want some more ear work. I'm not sure what I want. I was thinking possibly forward helixes. So, like, once those are healed up, I can put some. I'm on a hoop kick, I guess, because I want some hoops in my forward helixes too. And I'm symmetrical, so I got to be balanced on both sides. You but. should do orbitals, forward helix orbitals they're pretty flat aren't they oh don't tempt me like that uh, really I'm just, just so, yeah. saying yeah yeah, yeah. Oh, the cool kids um, are doing so, it i don't yeah. know if you knew and that. then my apprentice did my ear little piercings these seem to be pretty well healed up maybe i'll see if i can get some more going down here i tried before i didn't have any luck so yeah there's more i want very cool yeah. so it's an adventure it never ends if i find something new a piece of jewelry like who where can i put this this will look great here you know Sarah says hello from France. Hi, Sarah from France. Uh, got a flat twelve weeks ago, and everything feels good. No swelling, no pain. Can we downsize good. the jewelry? I would if I were you. Yes, if the swelling's gone down, you have some sticking out. It seems good. Get it downsized. If you leave the longer one in, it'll start migrating and changing angles. Congratulations on healing up quick. Christina had a helix done, and it was done in an 18 instead of a 16. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there a reason for the different gauges beyond personal preference? I personally found that 16-gauge stuff in most of the helixes healed a little bit better um, just because that part of your ear twists and contorts, and that jewelry can twist and contort. And it's it seems like the thinner ones caused more bumps, in my opinion. And it seems like more jewelry comes in the 16-gauge than the 18-gauge. So that's just why I'm a bigger fan. But on the forward helixes, I almost always do those at an 18 because we want that real small disc in the back. And, excuse me, try to make it as hidden as possible. All right. Uh, a little uh, follow-up from Ice Luzi says yes. the uvula piercing didn't actually hurt all that bad at all, like 5 of 10. But it was terrifying. I bet it was terrifying. And I can't imagine there really being a lot of nerves back there. It's so. Right. That explains why it's not necessarily terribly painful. That's awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations again. And thanks for letting me know. All right. Rebecca Bailey says, hi, guys. Love the channel. Hi, Rebecca. I'm curious. Have you ever experienced what I call phantom itching? This happens when you get a piercing in one ear, but the same spot itches on both ears. Hmm. I don't, maybe, I, I can't, I don't recall anything personally, but as soon as you said phantom, it made me think of my earlobes. Okay. Because I used to have stretched ears. They were two and a half inches. I could feel like a soda or a beer can in there. And then we had to remove them. If you don't know about it, I have a story on my story time on the channel. So check it out. But 
for a good year or so after, like I could do this and I could literally feel my earlobes. Wow. It was like phantom earlobes. It's just having them for like 20 years, you know, and it's like all of a sudden they're gone. Like you really feel them. Like the swing. I could, I could literally, yeah, I could. Wow. It was bizarre. It was bizarre. But I, the phantom itch, maybe, but I generally get things symmetrically pierced too. So I'm a glutton for punishment. Uh, quick question from Alex. Do you ever plan on making a video about stretching cartilage? A hundred percent. Um, we're planning a stretching series about all of the different piercings you can stretch. How many did we count? Well, it was like 20 plus piercings. It's a good, it's a good number. Like, a good half a lot of more piercings stretched. you can stretch than you would actually realize. So we're going to do a series on that. And it's the same thing, like how long for stretching between, how painful these stretches are, the types of jewelry, and you know what to expect. So Cover that stuff. It's, yeah, it's coming soon. We got you. Crystal just wants to say uh, she's been very inspired by your work and is in the process of becoming a piercer. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. And uh, we hope you're having a wonderful day too, Crystal. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had dermals? Yes, I have. Um, where have I had my... I think I've only had them in my arms. Um, I have... Let's see if I can show this off. You see, I have some snakes here. Okay. Yes. And this snake here used to have his eyes pierced with two dermals where I had red gems in there. And it was cool. cool. It was really cool. But the thing is, is every time I lean down, you can see how that's the first thing that hit. Mm. I walk by a doorway, it hit it every single time. And I had zero chance of healing this up. I had him once for two or three months, and I was just, I had it and I took him out and then Ten years later, I was like, I think I'll try it again. It looked really cool. And after about a month, I was like, oh, yeah, they're gone. <laughs> I remember why I hated this. <laughs> so that's my experience with dermals. Not real positive. <laughs> All right. The Real Deal says, hi, guys. Great show. What's up, Real Deal? Thanks for watching. My conch piercing is slightly closer to my head than in the middle or back of my conch. Will I be able to wear a ring in it when it's healed? The angle of the piercing's not straight. Uh, could you show us on the ear what we're talking about? Okay, so what they're saying is, like, normally you can see, like, there's a little tiny hole here. It's normally on the ridge because there's less distance from here to here to wear the ring. But some people will pierce it much further in, like in here, where it's in the center of the conch. And you can see the distance from here to here is much, much larger. Now, most people will pierce a conch at a 16 gauge. It seems to be the standard size. And 16 is too thin to make a large, large ring. So you might have to stretch it up to a 14 gauge because the 14 gauge can support the beads and you're gonna have more options in larger sizes. Yes, you can still wear a ring. It kind of depends on the angle. I don't, you kind of have to try it on to see. I, if it's pierced at an angle, it might be the wrong angle for it. Like I have conch piercings. You can kind of see there's a little hole in there. And when I wear rings, I wear like inch rings and they go below my earlobes because I have my earlobes removed. So it kind of fake the earlobe piercings. But so there's different ways to go about it. It depends on how you want it. But it's it just possible. You just might have to stretch it up if they're pierced too deep. So it just means a larger ring. The deeper on your conch that is, the, the ring will have to be bigger to get Correct. around your ear. And a lot of people like clickers with like the fancy gems and fanciness on there. You're limited on what you can get for those clickers. You might be able to get a basic ring, but as far as fanciness, it might be tough to find. All right. Next question comes from Gray. Hey, Scott. I'm okay. transgender post-top surgery. Okay. So one of my nipple grafts rejected, leaving me only with an areola. But I really want nipple piercings, though. Is there any advice or workarounds? Um, it's a possible... Oh. What I want to do is serve. It depends on your anatomy. Um, if there's no nipple and it's just the areola, if the skin's loose enough where I can actually pinch skin up like this, then you might be able to. We might then I might want to use like maybe a surface bar where we could add like two beads, a short surface bar, and that's going to kind of replicate the nipple piercing. I could pierce with a curved barbell, but the chance of rejection is extremely high. But if you healed it, it would also kind of pull that tissue up to kind of make it look like a nipple. Now, the other option is it might you might be able to get it pierced with a curved barbell multiple times. You know, so maybe pierce it like vertical with a, like a, a curved barbell. And when it starts to reject out, because chances are it probably will, then you're going to have that lump of scar tissue. And then you do another one where it kind of keeps pulling that tissue out to kind of replicate a nipple. Now, 
I don't know exactly, but it seems like with a rejected nipple graft, there'd be a lot of scar tissue in the area already. Is the piercing likely to move quickly through that scar tissue? It depends on how big the areola is and how that how old the scar tissue is. Sometimes with newer scar, everything's way tighter. Because I know like with, with breast implants, we generally have to wait a minimum of one year because the skin is so taunt that it generally causes the piercing to reject. So you need to have skin loose and relaxed. So that would be kind of the factor of like how tough is that tissue if you can't pinch it up i probably can't pierce you but if i can lift it up i think your best bet for replicating that would be maybe getting a surface bar excellent yeah well honestly another thing you could do is get it tattooed like some okay. people will actually get go to a tattoo artist who replicates in the cosmetic tattooing like that and they can tattoo a shadow of a nipple and then if we did the piercings next to it no one would be able to tell that's super that interesting. That might be kind of fun. Awesome question. Thanks for saying All right, great. So hopefully that points yeah. you in the correct direction. You can kind of explore some of those things. Uh, our next question comes from Connor. Uh, nice CI shirt. We're a Cigar International fan here. Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite cigar brand? And why is it not Padron if it's not? <laughs> La Flor Dominica is my favorite brand, my go to. Um, the Double Lajero, the DL700. I'm pretty specific on the cigar I like. That's my personal favorite. Sometimes, if I have all afternoon, I'll get the Digger, which is that super, super long one. It's just a big old stick. It's a great smoke. Um, I love the oil oiliness of that cigar. And um, yeah, why I don't like Padrones? It's not that I don't like Padrones, it's. You got to spend a lot of money on a really good one, and this one's a little bit more affordable. That's what it comes down to. There you go. Do you want to enjoy it more often or less often? I right? smoke some fantastic Padrones, but it's not an everyday smoke. Very good. Yeah. Uh, Crystal, who we spoke to earlier on, on the journey of becoming a piercer herself, yes. uh, wants to know, what do you recommend if cleaning piercings with just the wound wash spray, or do you use soap also? Whoa. Pros and cons of soap? Okay. Um Soap can be used if it's gentle enough. Now, most of the time, it isn't going to be gentle enough. Um, and if you're using the soap, I personally liked Dr. Bronner's baby soap. That's about as gentle as it gets. And you want to clean around the area. Now, the reason I don't suggest soap anymore is because surgeons generally don't suggest soap. If you get an operation on your arm and you had sutures on there, they're not going to tell you to clean it with soap and water. Keep it dry. Keep it covered. Don't get it wet. Let your body heal it up. Now, what we're doing is a much smaller wound. Let your body just heal it up. Soap eats some of that, you know, new skin cells, the old skin cells. So just let your body do its thing. So that's why I don't suggest it. And if you're going to use it, super, super mild soap. Connor wants to know, how do you feel about taking out a piercing immediately after being pierced to re-pierce again at a different angle right away? Sometimes I'll do it. It depends on the actual piercing. Um... I'm trying to think of situations where, yeah, like septums I can re-pierce right away. Um, navels, sometimes, depending on the angle, or if they're not happy with it, I might kind of change it. But if, if you're dealing with just a millimeter difference, a lot of times it falls into it. You just kind of create a bigger hole, and the jewelry sits where it wants to anyways. So it's situational. I, I, it depends on the situation. All right. Yeah. Uh, Tuppy Tappy says, thanks for the great advice, Scott. I've had five and counting piercings, thanks to your advice, and zero problems. Woohoo! Just starting to stretch ears, too. <laughs> Welcome to the journey. Oh, if you guys haven't done so already, make sure to hit the subscribe button and the like. And tell your friends to come in and then join the chat here. It's a lot of fun. All right. Andrea just had a nostril piercing last week, and we want to have another nostril piercing on the same side. How much should I wait to do it? And don't judge us for symmetry things. We like asymmetry, okay? <laughs> Not judging at all. I love the double piercing like that. Um, the thing is, is you got to wait till the swelling's gone down. The swelling is on the inside of your nose, not the outside, so no one can really tell. Now, depending on the type of jewelry, you can probably take your camera phone and take a picture. If it's the labret, the threadless style, you'll see that post getting longer on the inside. If it's a nostril screw, you might start seeing it move around quite a bit more. Generally, I tell people a minimum of a month. Let this heal all the way up before you re-pierce it so you can hit the right angles. Uh M. Tim wants to know, do you offer ear pointing or should I go to a surgeon or a professional piercer to handle something like that? Um, 
you're looking for a body modification artist. I don't know if any surgeons will actually do the ear pointing um, procedure. It's pretty intense, and I think you have to find a, a very well experienced uh, modification artist, not just a piercer. Because modification artist, it, it's scalpels. I mean, it's going to be the lidocaine sutures and questionable legality at that point, right? Yes, it's going to be under the table. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we're not recommending such a thing. We do not offer that service. No, and we're not sure a surgeon would either. But you'd want to make they sure might. That they might. They might. Because I guess they, they fix earlobes. That's fixing something, not. It's kind of been the whole uh, tongue bifurcation, the tongue splitting thing. It's like you got to go to an oral surgeon, and that's like all the piercers or modification artists will be like, well, find me an oral surgeon who will do it, because none of them will. So if the service can't be offered, I mean, it's. It's gonna it's, it's gonna show up somewhere, right? You know, absolutely. So, uh, all right. Next question. Ava White says, "I skipped my ear gauges to an eight when I first started because my earlobes were already pretty big." Sure. Is that okay, or is that going to cause future problems? Are they going to blow out over time? Um, it depends on how painful your, your stretching was. Some people wear stretch, like have their ears pierced forever and I've taken tapers and I've gone all the way up to a four gauge before without even hurting them because there's kind of a little bit more of the slits. If that was the case, it's not a problem if you didn't do any damage. So, um, and I'm, if that was the case, I'm glad you got some larger stuff in there so it doesn't keep cutting it down further. Now there should be uh, stretching symmetrically and even so they won't get thin on the bottom of your ear. All right. So, but yeah, that, that can happen. As long as you didn't, I can take the pain. It's not about pain. It's about being patient and just going to the right speed. Taking your time. Yeah. Uh, love the channel. Had to get one of my spider bites re-pierced, and that area is more sensitive. Is that normal? Depends on how old the piercing is. I mean, you, it might be a little bit because there's a little bit of scar tissue next to it, but... um. Yeah, I don't know. If it's all the way healed up and it's more sensitive, it doesn't make sense to me. Maybe it's the jewelry. God. Yeah. Or if it was more sensitive to get pierced because you went through scar tissue, that might be a little bit more painful to go through if that's what they're talking about. Could too. be. Nrom6 says, I stretched my septum to a 14 gauge seven weeks ago. Can I stretch it again yet? Um, seven weeks ago? Yeah. Um, maybe. Um, if you're wearing that 14 and the jewelry's moving around nice and freely, grab that 12 gauge and see if it just falls right into place. A lot of times septum stretch naturally on their own. Um, yeah, if it's moving freely, you should be fine. Generally, six to eight weeks between stretches on those. Cream Pie Lars wants to know, do you think bald people should be entitled to government-funded hair transplants? <laughs> it's a great like question. We, do we owe it? Cheryl's to definitely getting interesting, isn't it? Well, you know, they're not all piercing questions. Yes, I think it. I would love to be a hair farmer again. Oh, so you would grow the hair. Oh, you bet. I would have hair down to my butt. And get huge government subsidies for doing it. It would be great. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Miracle uh, growth. I'll come out on the other side. No way. No way. I, I think you squandered your hair and you don't deserve more hair <laughs> to, to just waste like you wasted your first hair. It started falling out when I was 19. It's not fair. Some people have a lifetime full of hair, and mine was taken away from me. Maybe you're lucky, and you just got to Vin Diesel uh, awesomeness before the rest of us. <laughs> I'm glad I had a round head. <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to, like, an incredible like point really one. choice, yeah. <laughs> you know, I tried going out, and I turned into that guy. With the long hair. Oh, and you really? pull it. Once I saw the picture from above, I'm like, oh, no, I'm that guy. <laughs> can't, can't do it. Joe Rogan it. Shave it all off and look tough again. It's the only way. All right. So. Thanks for asking. <laughs> Bentley says, hi, Scott. Just got my rook and nostril pierced. And as aftercare goes, I've been doing twice daily sea salt soaks. Is okay. that what you recommend? Um, it's not what I suggest. The sea salt soaks can be very soothing and feel really good. The problem with sea salt soaks is if you don't mix your salt to water ratio properly. You have to use fine grain, non-iodized sea salt soaks, sea salt mixed with um, distilled or filtered water each time you use it. Don't pre-mix a big gallon because it turns into a bacteria jug of it bacteria can, yeah just yeah bacteria <laughs> jug of bacteria yeah so um so you gotta pre-mix it each time what i suggest is a wound wash spray which is a pre-mixed sterile saline solution you spray it on there let the solution soak so it softens across you the same way you would just kind of soak your ear in there and that's generally the better way i personally found things heal faster with the spray than with the sea salt soaks it's hard to mix it properly 
each and every time. Plus, it's coming out of a can sterile. Right. And it's, it's just convenient. It's, it's five or ten bucks, and it's way more than you need for a piercing. Done. Yeah. Yep. All right. So. Uh, Andy wants to know, we have a crunch, five weeks old, healing great. When can we start to think about that ring? You're a fifth of the way through it. Yeah, five, six months minimum before you can wear a ring and a conch. Okay. Um, it's about a fifth, right? Fine. I'm, I'm, I'm carry, yeah. carry the two. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I generally tell like five, six months minimum before you change to the ring. Make sure you're fully healed, no crusties. Because if you're wearing a ring, that ring's going to be twisting and contorting when you're sleeping. And if you have crusties and it's spinning and rotating, you don't want to pull a file through that big old piece of cartilage. It is not comfortable. Your body will tell you when you're okay to wear that. But it's not yet. Okay, Katie has an interesting question. Uh, hi, guys. Hope you're having fun. We always are. We are. <laughs> uh, always wondering, if the angle on a cartilage piercing is so important for healing, how is it possible to heal an industrial? I mean, you could perfectly heal a piercing even if the angle isn't perfect with the right jewelry or aftercare. So I guess we're talking about piercings being perpendicular and, and industrials? Correct. I love that you asked this question. I have a video out there on floating industrials because of this. Some people have an ear like this where there's not the ridge, and we're still trying to go as perpendicular to that skin as possible. Same thing up here. You're able to go pretty perpendicular to the skin. Now, if you had, let me see, find a piercing like, like if you had an ear shape like this, and if I were able to do the piercing like this, you're not going perpendicular to that skin. You're going at an angle, it's going longer through it, and it's going to be a longer healing process. The proper angle would be closer to this, where you're going closer to 90 degrees through that skin. Now, this one is super, super important to have the angles matched as well, because you don't want to twist or contort the tissue. But I, I think that's what they're talking about. It's like, why can you go at an angle that you're not supposed to? It's supposed to be right. 90 degrees as much as possible. And and I think that point is, is that some people simply can't have an industrial because yes. their angles are wrong. Yes. So, so I think the assumption here is that just anyone could heal an industrial, and that's not the case. If yeah. you've got the wrong angles on your ear, you just can't have it. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. So so angles are important, and it does limit the piercings you can get, KV. Yeah, and they're even way more important on industrials than other piercings. Because it's two piercings tied yeah. together. Because it might not be 90-degree angle through your helix. You can still heal it. You're just limiting yourself on the way of the jewelry options and the way the jewelry looks. Okay. Very cool. All right. So we just have a, a few more questions we're going to take before we uh, just end up for the day. Uh Godor just wants to say that their first piercing was a septum, and they're loving it so far. Uh, to fill out the look, what do you recommend as a next piercing after a septum? I would have to see your face to see what's going to work best for you. But a lot of times you get a septum piercing, maybe you can either go up high or you can go low. Sometimes a lower lip piercing, whether it's a vertical labrat, a regular labrat, some matching snake bites, spider bites on one side. There's a lot of different options, but it depends on where you want to go. If you have hair that's already coming down kind of far and covering your upper, go lower. Or if you have the beard like me, maybe go higher, get a bridge and a couple eyebrow piercings. You have a lot of options. Daniel wants to know, what does it mean to be an APP member? Okay. The APP is an Association of Professional Piercers. Um, it's an organization that promotes health and safety throughout the piercing community. Now, to become an APP member, you have a bunch of hoops you need to jump through and prove to them that you're following their standards. It doesn't mean that they know how to pierce. It says that you're using this quality metal, that you're following this standard as far as like the glove changes, um, that you have proper cleaning, every, everything's the proper uh, cleaning utensils. Um, it's just, there's a bunch of things. You got to do a video walkthrough through the whole thing. If you search on YouTube, you can like type in um, APP, Association of Professional Piercers Walkthrough, and you'll see how they open every drawer, every single thing in that shop and show them. And then the board of directors for the Association of Professional Piercers looks through all of this and critiques things and says, hey, this needs to be changed. This is okay. You can't have this type of paint on the wall because it needs to be cleaned properly. 
that's pretty much what the APP is. So it's promoting health and safety and a good, clean environment. So it's not necessarily a, a, a voucher, the skill level of the piercer or the experience of the piercer. It just means they're, they're doing things in a clean and safe way for the most Minimal, part. I believe to be an APP active member, I think you have to be three years, show approved three years piercing experience as well. Okay. There's l- different levels of APP memberships, whether it's corporate, whether it's a shop membership. But um, yeah, that's kind of how it goes. But it does not guarantee skill level. You can still get a super crooked piercing from an APP member, but it'll be clean. And you could also, (laughs) the converse, you could get a very clean piercing from someone who's not an APP member, because just because they're not a member doesn't mean they don't also do things correctly. Correct, correct, yeah. And you can still get a super clean piercing, just like you said, and equally as crooked from a non-APP member. (laughs) We'll all get a crooked piercing. Yeah, and so... um, Find a piercer you like, look around, read reviews, things like that. that are what, that's what's going to tell you what a quality piercer is. If you go on Yelp and there's just consistent one-star reviews, don't go there. Absolutely. Ellen Sai has an interesting question. We actually just talked about this the other day. Sure. Why didn't you go to a hospital to have your earlobes removed when you decided it was time they, were, they had to come off? Okay. When I had my earlobes removed, it was around 1999, and... I had seen several people at that point in time who had gone to have their earlobes removed because they were like, oh, I stretched them up and now I need to get a real job because they were really socially unacceptable. Um, And people were coming back with just straight cuts on their ear and you could tell it looked like someone almost took a scissors and cut. I know it wasn't a scissors, but it wasn't aesthetically pleasing. Um, And when I knew I had to have mine removed, my friend was a body modification artist, and I knew we could aesthetically do it better than the doctors in my neighborhood. So that's why I trusted my friend who could do it just as clean and make it more shaped. You see, a lot of people don't even know. They'll look at my ears and go, your ears look kind of weird or what's going on with them. But it's like my earlobes were removed. But I've also seen them where they're straight across, and it's like your earlobes were cut off. Because I didn't want that. Because you were saying you and the guy actually even took like a marker and like planned out where the curve would be and what the ear would look like at the end. I have a video on this called Removing My Earlobes, I believe. On It's on the story time. So look at my channel and you can see it. Now, if you don't have a strong stomach, you might want to stop it right when we tell you to stop it. Because there's pictures of when they were cut off and burned and it's pretty traumatic. So go check it out. It's actually a pretty wicked story. <laughs> and the best thing I got out of all of this is being a good example to how not to do things. There is a right and a wrong way, and these are the consequences of not stretching your ears properly. So be patient, people. What uh, size are your nose plugs? Seven sixteenths of an inch. Um, I always forget. Is it seven millimeters? Is that eleven millimeters? Eleven. I, th- I don't remember. I think eleven millimeters. Yeah. All right. One size above a double zero. All right. We have so many good questions here. We're just going to take a, one more question and then get out of All here right. for the day. Uh, lots of awesome stuff. People saying you're the only piercer they trust and everyone loves you. They really appreciate all the feedback they're getting Thank for you. Thank you, everyone. I love all of you, too, and I wish I could keep going with these questions. We'll be, uh, we're going to start doing these every other week. It's, it's been too much for me to handle. I am a business owner. I am the p- only piercer at my shop and I'm running the YouTube channel. So we're going to go every other week, but we're going to try to get to all these questions here as best we can. All right. And last up, we'll say uh, the question from Baby, Can You Drive My Car? All right. And it is, what's the difference between a granulation a granuloma or a normal bump like like all these different terms we hear for piercing bumps like what are the differences like can we tell is are they all the same thing i am not a doctor so i technically can't tell you the difference between all of them that's why we say piercing bump or irritation bump a lot of times um there's different forms of bumps whether it's from chemical bumps from irritation sometimes it's uh the it's texture. So it's, I can't technically really say, but a lot of times it's just irritation. Um, and they're all dealt with in a similar way. Yeah. I mean, like there's, there's, uh, um, abscesses where stuff gets trapped under and you kind of create a bubble. Sometimes there's, uh, uh, I'm drawing in blanks on the actual keloids where it's a, a condition where it continues to grow. Sometimes it's hypertrophic scarring. There's a bunch of different ones. Most of it is just an irritation bump where it's like hypertrophic scarring. It's the type of bump it is. So basically it's not so much important what exactly it's defined as you 
kill them all by cleaning them and leaving them alone? Like, is that kind of the idea? Is that the sort of the process is similar no matter what you're, do you have to identify exactly what kind of bump no, you have? No, you don't have to put a name on to say that you have a bump. Okay. And that's what it is. There is different types of bumps. Most of them come from the irritation and you get rid of the irritation. The bump goes away. Like I said, I'm not a doctor, so I can't label each individual bump legally. So that's why we say irritation bump or piercing bump. All right. Yes. Now, with that being said, thank you everyone for tuning in. I had a great time here today. I hope you did too. If you haven't already hit the subscribe and the like button. And of course, keep putting holes in your body. See y'all in the next video.